morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Sunday Isaiah study. We're in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 1. Let's go to our Father in, in prayer. Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for all you do for us. We're so thankful for the fact that you created us, you made us, and that you uh, function in our lives, Father. You just didn't put us here and leave us to our own devices, but you explain to us and teach us <clears throat> uh, how you want us to act and what you expect of us. And we pray that you would, uh, that your will would be done throughout the world, that we would always submit to your will, and that you'd be glorified. We ask a special prayer for Rebecca, as we do for all of your people, Father. We pray that you would help us to uh, do the right thing, to always um, be your people and the example that you would want us to be. We're thankful for the forgiveness of our sins we have in your son, Jesus. <clears throat> and we pray that you just continue to watch over us as we uh, finish up the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> We're so thankful for Isaiah and the work that he did so that we might know how you work in the lives of men. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 64, and we're down here at verse 1 as we're getting into this section. And so what I want you to do is I want you to look at your, at your little booklet, and I want you to look at the outline because it's going to help you. And this would be, we're kind of in the middle of lesson, yes. Yep. No, I didn't mention it, but we will. They got that flu stuff. They got that flu stuff that's going around. Okay. So, 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 so Troy's family is a little under the, or part of Troy's family is a little under the weather. Uh, so make sure you fist bump Troy. <clears throat> and uh, so, so, so no kissing Troy today. So, you know, yeah. Um, all right. So, so if you look at uh, lesson number 25 in your booklet uh, and you, you take a look at that outline, it's going to help you today as we get into this section that we're dealing with. And as we're <clears throat> looking into this uh, lesson or into this section, uh, Isaiah 62 to Isaiah 64, what, what we're looking at is we're looking at the, the future state of God's people, but he's also going to remind us of Israel's present condition to contrast what he's going to be doing in the future conditions. And so as you uh, take a look at your paper there, and, and you look at the outline that deals with uh, Isaiah 64, uh, you'll notice that it's, it talks about the, the cry for God <clears throat> to manifest himself. So in, uh, in Isaiah 64, uh, what you're, what you're going to have is you're going to have basically Isaiah speaking for the people and talking to God <clears throat> and asking God to manifest himself so that people might know that he exists. Uh, certainly one of the problems during the, this period over here, what, in, in, whether it's, it's Israel's captivity or whether it's Judah's captivity, <clears throat> is they went off into captivity because apparently they didn't see they didn't recognize or they didn't accept what God had done before, and so they didn't really believe that God worked in their lives. And that's the same thing that we have today. In our world, we have the same thing today. Matter of fact, Peter talked about that in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, and beginning at verse 1. 2 Peter 3 and verse 1, he says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring uh, you up, uh, up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the latter days mockers will come um, with their mockings following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as it was from the beginning of creation. And so basically what he says is that people, people live, and if they don't see God in their lives, they say, there's no God. We haven't seen him. We didn't see him manifest himself. Uh, we, don't, we don't, you know, God hasn't come down in some vision. God hasn't appeared in the sky. Uh, so therefore, there must not be a God. And that's really what, what's happening with Isaiah. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 64, as Isaiah is going to enter into that section, but in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 3, uh, it's, uh, or verse uh, um, 5, it says, For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, and through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. He says people today forget about the flood. I mean, I haven't seen a universal flood in my lifetime, have you? Not a universal flood, 
We've seen local floods, but we haven't seen a universal flood. And, and so people forget about God, and they say God doesn't exist, God hasn't done anything, but yet God says, I destroyed the whole world with a flood. And they forget. They forgot that. So if, 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 if God doesn't manifest himself in some miraculous kind of way, people seem to forget about God. And that's what's going on with, I, with Israel, and that's what's going to go on with Judah. The reason they worship the idols and the reason that, that they serve other gods is because they don't see Jehovah working in their lives. And they don't see Jehovah doing things for them, which is kind of strange to me because the idols don't do anything for them. But somehow they see things that the idol does, but they refuse to see things that God does. And so it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it's kind of like what he's talking about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he's talking about the fact that God during the New Testament period, had given them evidence to his existence, uh, not only by the fact that, he was, that they saw him and he was raised from the dead, but then he sent the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit and some of his, uh, some of his people uh, were allowed to do miraculous activity that you could only do if God was with you. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware, for you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, However, you were led. He said, when, when you were following idols, you followed them. And he goes, they're mute. They don't talk. They don't move. So I don't know how you were, how you were led astray, but you were. You were led astray. On the other hand, God actually works in his world. And God has been sending them prophets after prophet and after. And God has been giving them ways that they might know that he exists. Uh, and ways that they would know that, that God is actually out there so that, in fact, they would believe him and follow him. So that's what you have going on here in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 1. So he starts off, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that mountains might quake at your presence. In other words, they're saying, God, show us. Show us yourself. Show us who you are, and, and maybe we'll believe you. Maybe Israel will believe you if we can see you do something. Okay, if we can see you do something. Um, and so he says in verse 2, as fire kindles the, the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to the adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. So, so Isaiah is saying, Lord, show up. Do something. You, you, uh, we haven't seen you. Now, of course, that's kind of interesting because uh, uh, God has shown up with the prophets all during this time. He sent, them, he sent them these prophets. He sent them Jonah and Amos and Hosea. He sent them Obadiah and Joel. He's, he's sending them Isaiah and Micah. He's sending all these prophets to them, and all these prophets did miraculous activity, and yet they're asking, show us yourself, Lord. Remember in the New Testament when Jesus had done a bunch of miracles and the Pharisees came up to him and said, show us a sign from heaven. Remember that? It's like Jesus' whole life has been doing miracles, and they don't want to see them. They don't want to see them. And, and so what he's, what he's pointing out here is that that's, that's what's going on here. So, he's, yeah, so Isaiah is saying, you know, kindle the fire. Do something so the nation will understand. Well, guess what people are going to understand when Israel falls, and guess what people are going to understand when Babylon falls? That there's a God. And when Babylon goes into captivity, they're going to be saying their God is no good, but then 70 years later, God is going to bring them back as a nation. They're going to come back as a nation. That doesn't happen. But it's going to happen for Israel because God is working in their lives. And so basically in verse 2, that's what he's saying. He says, do something so the nations will know. Well, the nations should already know. But Israel should know. Israel itself should know. But Israel is the ones that are going off into captivity, whether it's it's. Uh, uh, Assyrian captivity or Babylonian captivity, they're going to go off into captivity. Verse 3, he says, uh, when you do awesome things, which, you, uh, which we uh, did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. Now, what he's referring to there is he's saying uh, to, the, to God, do something like you did over here when you appeared to Moses on the mountain. When he appeared to Moses on the mountain, what happened to the mountain? It quaked, it shook, and there was a cloud over the mountain. There was lightning and thunder, and, and everybody knew God was up there. In other words, that, that's, that's, what he, that's what he's pointing out here. He, he's saying, God, you know, do something. Now, um, this can be taken in two ways. It can be uh, Isaiah, 
It can be Isaiah talking to God and saying, God, I want you to come down so the nation, so Israel can see what you're doing, so, so Israel can believe you. <clears throat> or he's, he's uh, 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 pointing out that, God, we haven't seen you, and, and, and we need to see you, and, and that's why people don't believe in you, which, of course, isn't really true. God's been showing up all the time. Verse 5, he says, uh, you meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you're, uh, you were angry, for we sinned. We continue in them a long time and shall be saved. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, or he says, and shall we be saved. So, so what he points out in verse 5 is that God does show up. But who does he show up for? He shows up for those who rejoice in doing righteousness. During this time, was Israel doing righteousness? Before Israel, before Judah goes off into captivity, were they doing righteousness? Were they, were they trusting the Lord, or were they trusting in all the idols that were around them? They were trusting in those idols, weren't they? And so, he, so he's pointing out, God, w God will appear, but he appears and he rejoices with those who rejoice in doing righteousness, who remember you in your ways. In other words, who remember what, what God's ways are. Notice it doesn't say our ways. We remember God's ways. Um, how many of you can say the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy, thy. So one of the first things that he tells us to pray for before we ask him for our stuff is your kingdom come, your will be done. We, we get to participate in God's will and we get to be part of God's kingdom. That should be first in our prayer. Then we can ask God what we need or what we want, but we need to put his desires first. And that's what he's saying here when he says, who remember you in your ways. In other words, they remember how God acts. They remember what God does. People today in our world over here, in our world, they say there is no God. They say there's no God because look at all the wickedness that's in the world. So there's no God. Was there a God when there was wickedness over here with Israel and Abraham and Isaac and them? There was wickedness in the world, wasn't there? Was there no God then? There was a God. When, when uh, the devil showed up to tempt Eve, was there no God? There was God. See, the problem is that people don't know God's way. They've decided, that they just, they've decided on how they expect God to act. They, they want God to act the way they want them to. Uh, they think God should act. And when God doesn't act the way they think God should act, they say there's no God. And instead of, we need to make sure that we follow God's way. So even as they're going off into captivity, God has a purpose for them going off into captivity. The purpose is to bring them out as a group of people so that he can reestablish them in uh, Jerusalem and in that area so that the Messiah can come through them. So there's even a purpose for God in punishing them. And there's a purpose for God in punishing individuals. We need to understand God's way, not our way, not what we think, not what we want, not, not how we feel about things, but what does God say about things? Uh, do you remember when, when uh, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, were offering strange fire and they died? Remember what Moses told uh, uh, Aaron? Don't grieve. Wait a minute, he just lost his sons. What do you mean don't grieve? Why wasn't he supposed to grieve? Why wasn't he supposed to mourn? Because he was representing Jesus in the temple. He was the high priest. And the high priest does not mourn over God's judgments. The high priest doesn't go, oh, too bad they were killed. No, the high priest goes, they deserved it. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. That's what's supposed to happen to them if they don't do what they're supposed to do. Jesus doesn't want us to be punished, but that's what's going to happen if you're punished. It's not like God's, God's making a mistake when he punishes people and God's going, oh, I wish I had to, had to do that. No, everything God does is just and right. We need to walk in God's way, and that's what he's pointing out here. So God, so God does appear to those who walk in his way, and those people who see his way they understand that God has always been around. God has not left them to their own destruction. 
He says, uh, uh, as Israel goes, he says, we've continued uh, in them in a long time talking about their sins. He says, for we sinned. <clears throat> God was angry with us, for we sinned. Uh, and he says, and we continued in them a long time, and shall we be saved? Now, he points out that Israel's sin wasn't just something they did one day. It wasn't like one day they sinned, God said, okay, I'm fed up with you. He says, we sinned for a long time. We kept on sinning. God sent us, sent us prophets. God sent us uh, uh, people to talk to us. God sent us the law. God told us what we were doing wrong. God, <clears throat> God sent plagues, and God sent, sent mildew, and he, he made the ground hard so we wouldn't have a harvest. He didn't let our, our cattle uh, 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 bear. Uh, God, God did all kinds of stuff to, to try to uh, get them to turn around because they, were sin they had sinned for a long time. And so he says, and shall we be saved? In other words, he goes, are, are, are we going to be saved if we act like this? Okay, if God shows up, is he really going to save us because this is the way we, we've been doing because we haven't been people who do righteousness. We haven't been people who do what's right and care about God's way. Uh, Israel and, and, and Judah have cared only about their way. Verse 6, <clears throat> He says, for, for, all of us ha, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, and all, uh, and all of us whether, whether, uh, wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind uh, uh, takes us away. Now, sometimes people use this verse, and they basically say that everything man does is wicked. Man can't do one single thing right. Everything he does is, is wrong. And the Calvinists really like this verse. <clears throat> and many people have, have misapplied this verse. Uh, God looks at our righteous acts. God remembers the good deeds that we've done. It's not like, like you know, if, if, if you love your wife and you love your kids, God says, oh, look, they're so bad at loving their wife and loving their kids that I'm not even going to look at that. No. Uh, God looked at, at Joseph, and God said Joseph was a righteous man. You remember Joseph who was married to to Mary, God said he, he, he was a righteous man. Uh, Simeon was a righteous man. God, God often talks about people being righteous individuals. So when he talks here about their uncleanness, he's not talking in general about every single activity that man does is unclean. What he's talking about is Israel. Israel right here. Their worship to God, their righteous activity to God, which they were supposed to do, what would some of that righteous activity be they were supposed to do? And if you're not sure what it is, read Isaiah chapter 1, because that he started off with, with those righteous acts. What were some of those righteous acts? I'm sorry? Well, they worshiped idols, but what were the righteous acts they were supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to worship God, but will love people. But how did they do that? How did they manifest that? And, and I know loving people, but how did they manifest that? in a visual way. Sacrifices. They were supposed to keep the sacrifices. They were supposed to keep the Sabbath. They were supposed to keep the festivals. There was certain activity they were supposed to do that were righteous activities. But God says your righteous activities, these activities that Israel is doing, they're not righteous. Now, why not? In Isaiah chapter 1, he told you why they weren't. Why didn't God accept their righteous acts? Because it wasn't from their heart, and their hands, he said, were full of blood. Their hands were full of blood. So they offered these righteous acts to God, and God says, they're worthless. They're like filthy rags. Not every time somebody tries to do something that God wants them to do, there is filthy. God's talking about these people, and he's pointing out that these people, when they offered their religious worship to God, it was filthy. That's why they're going off into captivity. If they hadn't, if that nation had been doing offering sacrifices the right way, if they had been doing what God says the right way, they wouldn't go off into captivity. But because it wasn't from the heart, because they weren't doing it the way God said they were supposed to do it, God says they're filthy. Yes. Well, they're relying on their own understanding, but not just that. They weren't doing what God says. They were offering the animal sacrifices. But why wasn't God accepting them? Because their heart. 
Let's just look at Isaiah chapter 1 real quick and just re remind ourselves of what he says. Okay? He says to them, here, uh, beginning in verse 10, Isaiah 1.10, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear uh, to the instruction of our, our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, is he talking about Sodom and Gomorrah? Aren't Sodom and Gomorrah already destroyed? They've been destroyed for a long time. So who's he, who's he talking to? Israel. He's talking to Israel. He says, you're like Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? See, they're bringing sacrifices. Those are the righteous acts they're supposed to do, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? He says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths, your calling of assembly, I cannot endure iniquity and the Solomon assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am wearied of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. So, those are the righteous activities that he's talking about over here in Isaiah chapter 64. And down here at verse 6, he's not telling us that nothing we can do is right with God because God tells us that he remembers the righteous deeds of his people. He, he remembers the good works of his people. And we're supposed to be doing good works. We're supposed to be doing uh, what God wants us to do. And, and so sometimes people take this verse, especially the Calvinists, and they say, see, nothing man does is any good. Nothing man uh, does they can do right. And so therefore God has to regenerate them. God has to make them into new, this new person before they can do anything right. And that's really not what it's talking about. So verse 6 says, for all of us have become like one who is unclean. He's talking about Israel. And all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And all of us, wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, uh, and our iniquities like the wind, take us away. So Isaiah is pointing out their sin. He's pointing out their sin. He wants God to show up so that they can know there's a God, so that they can turn from their sin and from their wicked way before it's too late. <coughs> so verse 7 says, There is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the, hand, into the power of our iniquity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the power of our iniquity is this right here. They're going off into captivity. They're going to be held by their own sin, and they're going off into captivity, and the power of their captivity is going to be when Assyria shows up or when Babylon shows up and carries them off into captivity, and that's going to be the power of their iniquity. They're, they're going to see their sin. They're going to see the consequences of their sin. And God always has consequences of sin. Those consequences weren't put in there by the devil. Consequences of sin were put in there by God. The, the devil uh, caused people to be separated from God, but God's the one who said, you're now going to be cursed. And, and the reason he said it is because that's the, that's the result of not following God. If you don't follow God, the result is, since God's the one who gives life and you don't follow him, what's going to happen to you? You're, you're going to die. Who determined that? God did. God determined that. The devil didn't determine that. God determined that. The devil just uses it. <clears throat> the devil uses what, what God's will is uh, uh, to try to keep people from serving God. Uh, and, and so that's what he's pointing out here. He says, for you have hidden your face from us, and have delivered us into the power of our iniquity. So they're going to go off into captivity because of their sin uh, and, and because of their wickedness. So I'm not sure that they really want God to show up. Now, verse 8, he says, But now, but now, O Lord, you are our father, and we are, we are the clay, and you are potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. <clears throat> so as Isaiah is writing, he's saying we're supposed to be your people. We're supposed to be your pottery. We're supposed to be your clay. We're supposed to be who you make us into. That, that's who we're supposed to be. Okay? He's saying, you, you are the potter and we're the clay. 
uh, that's who you are. Now, verse 9, he says, uh, Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people. So he's trying to appeal to God because he knows they're going off into captivity. <clears throat> and so he's appealing to God that we're your people. Don't forget we're your people as you send us off into captivity. Re remember that. We're, we're supposed to be your people. So, so um, uh, we're the work of your hands. So don't be angry with us forever, right? Now, do you ever get angry with your children? Now, do you get angry with your children forever? No. <laughs> depends on it depends on how often they do something bad, right? But but we don't we're not angry with our kids forever. We are angry with them when they do something wrong. There's consequences that they have to bear, and sometimes that requires us to be angry. But we're, we don't want to be angry with them forever. That's what that's what Isaiah is saying. Lord, we're going off into captivity as a nation. We're your people. Don't be angry with us forever. And God is not going to be angry with them forever because they are His people. Now. <clears throat> Why is he saying that? Look at verse 10. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Now, I believe when he says this, it's not quite time for, uh, remember, Isaiah's preaching here, uh, Israel, I'm sorry, Bab Judah has not gone into Babylonian captivity yet, but he's viewing it as if they have. He's viewing it as if Israel has gone off into captivity. And besides, when Assyria attacked Israel, the ten northern tribes, they also made incursions into Judah, and many of their cities were actually destroyed, and they came down to the very neck of, of, of Jerusalem, the, the city of God, but God delivered them. And so many of their cities in Judah were devastated. And that's what he's pointing out here. He's saying, your holy cities have become a wilderness. In other words, some of those cities have have been destroyed, and not only that, but many of the people have fled those little cities and have run to Jerusalem for protection, and so those cities are abandoned, and Isaiah is saying, you know, Lord, don't be angry with us forever. Look at our condition. Our condition is that the cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become, Zion itself has become a wilderness, the area of Zion, and Jerusalem a desolation. When he says a desolation, he's saying Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. It, it's, going to, it's going to come to ruin. And so he says, remember us. Now, verse 11. He says, our, our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praised you, has been burned by fire. And all our, all our precious things have become a ruin. So now he's talking about the temple. He says the temple is going to be destroyed. Okay? The, the temple over here is, is going to be destroyed. But even during this time here when Judah was around, even though the temple was up, Many times it had idolatrous uh, idol images in it, and they were using it for idolatrous purposes. So basically, it was, a, it was destroyed or a desolation. But it's physically going to be destroyed in, when Babylon comes and physically destroys it, and, and they go off into captivity, and it's going to look like there's no hope for Israel. Now, verse 12, he says, Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent? <clears throat> excuse me, and afflict us beyond measure. So he says, Lord, when is that going to stop? When are you going to stop doing this? When are we going to find peace? Okay, when are you, when are you going to give us blessings? So now, chapter um, 65, and if you're looking in your, in your notes, you might take a look at the next lesson that you have, which has 65 in it. And if you, if you take a look at this section, uh, what you're going to notice is that uh, uh, Jehovah comes looking. Okay, Jehovah's going to take notice of what's going on. And, and Jehovah is going to do what he needs to do in order to bring about his purposes and his promise. Okay, that's in your last lesson that's on lesson number 26, uh, where you have that outline, where you might take a look at it and follow along with this uh, as we read this. Now, 65 verse 1. He says, I permit myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation which did not call on my name. Now, he's contrasting Israel, who should have been God's people. They should have known who God was. He's going to contrast them with the Gentiles over here, the Gentiles who are going to come to God, the Gentiles who are going to be God's real nation. 
the Gentiles who are going to actually worship God and serve God, okay, Un unlike the Jewish community and even the Orthodox Jews today, many of them still don't believe in Jesus. And, and they're, waiting, they're waiting for their Messiah to come, and they don't accept Jesus. He says, uh, but in chapter 65, verse 1, he says, but I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not uh, ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation which did not call on my name. So, so the Gentiles who weren't seeking God, they're, they're going to call on God, and so God is going to replace, uh, and, and I don't want to say replace, but uh, the, the, the main section of, of, of God's people or, or the main um, citizens of God's people during the Messiah's reign is going to be Gentiles. Uh, do you remember the parables that Jesus would give them about, about the uh, owner of the, of the vineyard who had a vineyard? He rented it out, remember? He rented it out, and, and so he sent somebody to get his proceeds. What did they do to him? They killed him, so he sent other servants, and they killed them too and mistreated them. What did he finally do? He said, I'll send my son, and, and they'll respect him. What did they do to his son? They killed him. So he said, what will the owner do when he comes? And what did the people tell him? You're going to destroy those people who you gave the vineyard to, and you're going to give it to another people who will give you the fruit that you deserve. Well, the nation he took it away from was Israel. The nation he gave it to were the Gentiles. And so as as Isaiah is kind of writing and saying, Israel has done all this stuff. Israel is going into captivity. Israel, as the nation is going, is basically going to be lost. As the as the as the physical nation, they're going to they're going to be lost. The remnant will be saved, but the physical nation is going to be lost. God says, "No worries. I have another nation. I have another group. I have people who will accept me. I have people who will follow me. Who will give me the honor that I deserve." And so it says in verse 2, I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in, in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. So why is, he letting the, why is he letting this nation that hasn't called on his name follow him? Because he's been asking Israel to believe him, to trust him, to follow him, and they wouldn't. They, they, they haven't been as a nation. They haven't been following him. So God says, I'm going to get a different people. I'm going to, get, I'm going to take the, the vineyard, uh, and I'm going to destroy those people who were supposed to give me fruit, and I'm going to, I'm going to destroy uh, them, and I'm going to give the, the kingdom or the, the uh, vineyard to a people who will bear fruit for me. And that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be those people who bear fruit. And so as he's talking about the contrast with why it is that he's going to open up his kingdom to the rest of the world, he says in verse 3, he says, A people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in the gardens and burning incense on bricks, who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of unclean meat is in their pots, who say, Keep yourselves, <coughs> keep to yourselves, do not come near us, for I am holier than you. These are, are, are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day long. Behold, it, it is written before me, I will, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will even repay uh, into their bosom, uh, both their, their own iniquity and the iniquities of their fathers together, says the Lord, because they have burned incense on the mountains and scorned me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their, their former works uh, into their bosom. And so he's pointing out these people that uh, Israel, who, he, who should have followed him, which is why he's letting the, the nations who didn't know him, those people who weren't called by his name, he's letting them come in. He, uh, why is he doing that? <clears throat> because he says in verse 3, a people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifice in the gardens and burning incense on bricks. In other words, these individuals... Uh, uh, over here during the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity, before they went off into captivity, they were, offer, they were offering sacrifices to, to the idols. And, and they would do it out in their gardens. They would do it out in the orchards. They would do it out in other places. Where are they supposed to worship God? In the temple. 
But instead, they're out in the garden. They're out over there. They're out in other places uh, worshiping gods. Uh, <coughs> and, and that's what they're doing. And they're walking according to their ways, not according to God's ways. Verse 3 says, a people who continually provoke me to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 4. He says, who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places. The idea of sitting among graves is, is they would worship the dead. Uh, that was called ancestor worship. And so they would go to the graves and they, they would have ancestor worship. Uh, okay, And that's kind of like in Mexico where, where they have what's called the uh, uh, Dia de los Muertos. Uh, you and I call it Halloween, but they celebrate it different. They actually go to the grave sites and, and they put uh, uh, flowers and stuff on, on their ancestors because they believe if they don't that they're going to be cursed. <clears throat> and so they go and sit, sit among the graves. And that's what these guys were doing uh, in their day and time, according, according to what they were doing. Uh, and it says, so they sit in the secret places. In other words, they're, they're places where, where they don't want people to see them doing what they're doing. And he says, and the broth of uh, uh, who, who eats swine's flesh, are, are Israelites supposed to eat bacon? No, poor guys. Uh, and, and he says, and broth of unclean meat it, uh, uh, is in their pots. Do you remember when, when uh, they would offer a sacrifice? How, how was that sacrifice supposed to be cooked in the temple? It's supposed to be boiled. Here, what are they boiling? Unclean meat. See, rather than boiling the right sacrifices, they're boiling pigs. They're, they're boiling unclean animals in their sacrifice to their gods. That's what's in their pot. Verse 5, he says, who, keep, uh, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near, for I am holier than you. Why are they doing this? Because they're saying our religion is better than your religion. We're, we're right, you guys are wrong. We're holy, you're not holy. Yes. With what? She threatened you with bacon? Oh, wow. Just tell, just tell her you're not Jewish, you'll be okay. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, so these individuals say, we're holier than you. In other words, what they're saying is, our God, our false God we're following, is better than your God. We're holier. We're, we're more set apart than you guys. Remember the word holy means to be set apart. They're saying, our God, look at what our God is doing for us. Your God isn't doing anything for you. And, 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 and that's, what they, that's what they were saying here. Matter of fact, when Judah goes off into captivity, what's interesting is, is they come to... to uh, uh, Hezekiah, or I'm sorry, they come to Jeremiah, and they ask Jeremiah, the people that are left, they come to Jeremiah, and they say, Jeremiah, what does God want us to do? And Jeremiah says, I'll tell you, you're not going to do it. They say, no, no, we promise we'll do it. And, and so Jeremiah comes back and says, here's what God says. God says to stay here in the land while the, while the uh, Babylonians are ruling over you, stay in the land, and God will bless you and follow God. Remember what they said? No, we're not going to stay here because if the Babylonians come, they're going to kill us. So we're going to go to Egypt. And besides, we're not going to follow God because when our wives were making raisin cakes to our God that we followed, our life was good. But now look at what's happening. Now we're being destroyed, and it must be because we left our, we, we left our false gods, so we're not going to follow God. We're not going to do what you want us to do, so we're going off to Egypt, and they took Jeremiah with them. That's what, that's what they're saying here. Our God's better than your God. We're holier than you. Well, you know what happened to them in Egypt? When Babylon arrived in Egypt, he conquered them there and killed them all there. Verse 6, no, middle of verse 5 says, For uh, I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. Uh, have you ever been in a place, have you ever been uh, maybe camping, and you sit down by the fire, and, and I, don't, I don't know how this works, but there must be a fire demon. Because no matter where I sit next to the fire, the smoke comes my way. And it starts burning your eyes, right? So what do you do? You get up and you move, right? And, and then the fire demon sends the wind that way, right? No matter where you go, the, the smoke gets to you, right? It burns your eyes. That's what God says these people are to him. These people who do these things, who don't listen to him, they're like smoke and, and 
in his nostrils and, and in his eyes. They irritate him and they bother him. That's, that's the way he, he feels about them. Now, verse 7. He says, both their, their own iniquities and the iniquities of their fathers together, says the Lord, because they have burned incense on the mountains and, and scorned me on the hills, therefore I will measure their, their former works into their bosom. In other words, God says, because they acted that way, I'm going to give them what they want. They want to serve other gods? Fine. I'll give them other gods. Let's see if those gods can protect them from Assyria. Let's see if those gods can protect them from Babylon. Let's see if those gods can protect them from all the things that are going to happen to them. Let's see how, how well their gods act, how well their gods function. <clears throat> and so he says in verse 8, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the, in the cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for there is benefit in it, so I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. So he says, even though that's the way Israel is, I'm not going to destroy all of them. I am going to redeem them. So we'll start there next week, and hopefully we'll finish this up uh, as, as we do that. Uh, any questions or thoughts anybody has? Yes. <clears throat> say there's no God. It's kind of like me looking at Chad and say, there's no such thing as a barber. <laughs> <laughs> he meant that in a good way, Chad. <laughs> uh, so, but that's exactly right. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's have ourselves a prayer. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that you have given to us your prophets of old and Isaiah, Isaiah as we've been studying him that you brought to light those references and those verses that help us understand how you hate evil, but you love people who try to do right. We pray, Father, that we, as your people, who were not called, who did not call on you before, can now call on you. We pray that we call on you in the name of your Son, that we follow him and obey him and serve you, Father. And we pray that you help us to see your work in our lives, that you really do function in our world that you do answer our prayers, that you give us the requests that we desire that are, that are in accordance with your will. And we pray, Father, that you help us always to see you in all the things you do for us. We praise you and thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.